Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hi. Hey. How you doing? I'm good. <laughs> you sure? How are you? I am awesome. Nice. I've been doing lots of stuff in the gym. I've been down there really working on, you know, I'm now into yoga. Yes. This is not news. I've started being interested in yoga very late in life, I might add. Yes. But... I just ordered a t-shirt from my favorite yoga studio. Yeah. And it says, practice is everything. Oh, yeah. And I was thinking about that, generally speaking. <clears throat> practice practice is, is everything. And I was thinking about, like, just people in our family and what we're practicing. Like, I'm practicing yoga. You're practicing trying to get to the splits, which <laughs> means you're doing something every day yeah. for a certain amount of minutes because you're trying to sort of train your body. Yeah to be able to do things just like I'm trying to train my body to be more flexible and you know Alina's practicing for her marathon and Carter is practicing lacrosse and so I was thinking about this idea that practice is so prevalent in our daily life in terms of like athletics and sports yes but I would argue that we probably need practice in all kinds of things and I noticed you were talking the other day I don't remember who you were talking to about making that analogy to the mind, mm. right? But I would I would imagine that that was not an easy conversation because people don't associate practice with sort of cognition and thinking. Yeah. So I just wanted you to tell me a little bit more about that, like what you were thinking about. And I think you were talking about, <clears throat> you made some analogy to basketball or something. Yeah, but I think I used basketball, uh, but you could use anything. I mean, and everything's sort of like this if you, if you follow the, the historical trajectory of things, right? So like when I started climbing, oh. the 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 way you trained for climbing was you went climbing. That was it. That was it. We didn't, con- there was no concept that you would go train or practice climbing. You just climbed and the more you climbed, the better you got at it. And that was it. And nobody thought like, hey, what if I, you know, made a fingerboard and started practicing just, you know, isolating my finger strength or isolating certain right. moves. Or what if I had a gym that, what if I used the gym, but used it as a climber, you know? And, um, and I think, you know, there probably was a time long before us where people thought that way about music, you know, about oh, playing the yeah. guitar and about all the things we practice. In fact, I think there probably was a time where people felt that way about all sports and basketball, you know, the best way to be basketball player is just to play basketball. Right. But somebody along the way kind of looked at basketball at, at a meta level, you know, meta basketball, <laughs> meta ball, <laughs> meta ball, like meta ball. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and they said, well, you know, well, what are, what's basketball fundamentally made up of? Like it's a complex game, but if right. we could reduce it to sort of patterns, Right. There's the pattern of dribbling mm-hmm. both hands. You know, there's the pattern of passing. There's the pattern of shooting, you know, close up shots, far away shots, you know, so that you kind of break down the game into a bunch of different patterns. Right. And and then you practice those patterns. And I, I imagine like so, somebody had to be the first person to be like, hey, what if we practice dribbling? You know, like what if we practice shooting? Hmm. What if we practice, what if, what if rather than getting 20 or 30 shots in a game, you could get 200 shots in a, in a half an hour. Right. Right. Will that make you better at shooting? Right. And what, in, instead of only playing, you know, the guitar when, when on a Friday night gig, mm-hmm. what if you, you know, practice your chords over and over and over again and you got, you know, a, a couple hours of practice. Right. Sounds kind of basic, but we live in a world today where thinking hasn't entered into that world yet, hasn't entered into the world that we understand basketball or weight training or yoga or any of these other things that we take for granted that we take as sort of, you know, obvious. Right. Thinking has not entered that world yet. Meaning we haven't entered to a place where we believe that you can actually practice something to get better at it, like any sport. If you practice certain things. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. Number one, that. Yeah. That we, we don't even know that you could practice it. 
right? And number two, if if we did know that, what would we practice? We don't even know what to practice, right? So yeah. we're not even at the point where, I mean, we are at the point, but most people don't realize we're at the point where we can break the game of thinking down into something the yeah. equivalent of dribbling, you know, shooting, passing, and if you practice those things, and then and then also practice doing it in in you know game scenarios, that you can get really really good at it really really fast. Yeah, no, I mean that makes sense, but it's kind of interesting because it's it's hard to to retroactively think about that moment where somebody said, "Oh, totally, we could do this." I think for a long time it was sort of like the <clears throat> great man theory, right? Leaders are born. Totally. Athletes are born, 100%. thinkers are born, yeah. you're either this or you're not. And it's not, you have no agency over it. You have no, you're just, you, you are what either you are. one Kobe right. Bryant or you're not. But Kobe Bryant practiced a lot. You know? Yeah, so like, Michael Jordan, so, yeah, right? Exactly. So did, I don't know, I don't know a lot of athletes. <laughs> That's okay. But I think if you, if, if anybody sort of thinks about something, if, especially if you've been around long enough to sort of see the, the ebbs and flows of things. You, you probably grown up in something that, um, you know, that at one point in time nobody thought to practice, and today they do. You know, uh, whether that be, you know, like like I like I mentioned, climbing. Um, yeah. But I think all kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, also I think you have this this um, almost sort of misunderstanding. Sometimes people think of practice as something that's sort of punitive, like yes. go practice this, go yeah, run laps, that's... go do this, go do that. And it's it's not always thought of as um, something you have control over to actually get better at something you care about. Totally, and I, I think that's a, that's an unfortunate thing, which I, probably high school sports did that, right? Yeah, for sure. Everything seemed punitive. Like That's where I learned you know, running was not a fun right. thing because running was always used as like a punishment right sprints and yeah yeah so yeah you don't want to think of practice as punitive uh, um i think ideally you want to think of it as creative as a creative act so i notice even for example when i'm doing yoga which is you know not easy for for me you know um and uh i notice that when when i'm like bearing down and you know it's not that enjoyable but when i'm just being creative and i'm like hey i'll try this you know yeah. i'm gonna my body feels like doing this you know and, then, and i'm not like oh there's this move and i have to practice it i'm like hey my body feels like doing this right then i i actually get better stretches i get better uh, you know kind of releases and i also it's more fun and the time passes much faster and yeah so you know, when we were kids, a long time ago, <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I was a kid, so I grew up in a big family, yes. big Colombian uh, family, and um, uh, we, I, I, my mom had one one rule, mm -hmm. and that was you had to be at dinner every night. Right. You know, otherwise we were pretty much off in the woods or at, you know practice or what, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had to be at dinner every night, and we sat around the table as a big family. And my dad had this. Uh, this like uh, habit mm -hmm. that I just thought was normal because I grew up with it. But yeah, um, and that was that like you know we'd ask him some question and he would he would use the food at the table to like build the answer. <laughs> Not normal. It wasn't until I like you know slept over at friends' houses when I was like you know twelve or thirteen that I realized and had dinner with their families that I realized like oh not. I didn't know, and <laughs> That's an awkward nobody does moment. this, right? But he would, I, we would be like, hey, Dad, you know, what, what was the Korean War all about? I need to be like, oh, you take this piece of bread, and you take this piece of chicken, and, and then you put a fork in both sides of the bread and the chicken, make like a little barbell, and yeah. he'd be like, the fork is like the relationship between the, the two countries, which is, you know, Korea and China, and, and then, you know, take this other piece of bread, and he, he'd build this whole thing. And then he'd break down the fork. I'm into, sure your mother loved that. Yeah, it was crazy. And he'd have like salt and pepper shakers. And he, he would just like build this model. Okay, so your father would pick up the food, salt shakers. I'm sure your mother didn't love it. And all of your brothers and sisters loved it because he was actually literally manipulating the food. But what, what was he doing? Like what was he trying to do for you all? Yeah, I don't even know if my mom didn't like it. Like it was just, it was just like a normal thing. 
He was just building. He would like visualize the ideas as we talked about them, and so it was. It was. It was kind of like the extension of using your hands to talk, but it was like yeah. he took it to the nth degree, and he would build, physically build the ideas, so you could see the ideas. The amazing thing is that it had a kind of a profound effect on me. I think it's why I study. You know what you study. What I study. Yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing it did was it kind of gave me it made it so that I could see ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Not just have them like locked up in my head, but I could see right. the ideas yeah. because they were in front. I could Touchable. look at them, yeah. but right. Then it made the ideas kind of tangible because they were physical things. You could, you could add to it. You could say, what if, what if we, you know, added that to it, you know, right. and he would incorporate that in. So we could add to it. We could subtract from it. We could break the bread in half and think about it as two factions or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Right. And so it made it very, it made ideas very tactile. It almost made ideas like, you know, like minority report, you know, like, so it was like, that was, that was like my dinner table, except it was analog. It wasn't, Every night. it wasn't digital. Yeah. <laughs> it was like analog with was bread like the 70s? and chicken <laughs> in the seventies. Yeah. So, so, and then as a result of that, because ideas were these things that you could like play with, mm -hmm. this is my point of this whole story. There is, is a point there's coming. A point. Yeah, I got <laughs> it. I promise. <laughs> because ideas were these things you could see and touch and play with. Yeah. It was fun. It was creative. Yeah. It was it was fun to play with ideas. When you say it, you mean like thinking about thinking stuff. Thinking was fun. Thinking about stuff was Thinking fun. about stuff was fun. It was creative. Yeah. It was tangible. It was visible. Yeah. It was, and this is so is critically important to to the work we do, and uh, ironically, you know, the the science has proved out all of these things that he was doing at the table to be yeah empirically valid in yeah. terms That's of awesome. the way that the brain works and what the brain needs to learn and understand things to be able to see to be able to yeah. Um, you know, touch them and move them. Touch and because all those around. neurons fire differently. Exactly. Right? If you're touching stuff and moving it. Exactly. Right? It's from cortical homunculus or the cortex, man, and how the brain is hooked Try up. Try googling that. Yeah. Cortical homunculus. Cort yeah, cortex, man, or cortical oh, yeah. homunculus. I mean, when you a, spell it out, it's like super califragilistic. It is a little it's bit long, difficult to long. spell, but yeah. that's just the way your brain is hooked up to yeah, your yeah. like the the way your brain's hooked up to your body. And we have more neurons hooked up to our eyeballs yeah. and our tongue and our hands than than anything else. Which right, listening is not our strong suit. Sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> which is strange because if you think about it, in school, you know, yeah. most of what we're doing in school is talking and listening. Yeah, you know, it's and hard. what we need to be doing is seeing. Yep. And touching and moving stuff stuff around and even tasting. Like in, I've always said. You know, chemi a lot of students have trouble with chemistry. Yeah. Turn chemistry into a cooking class. That would be fun. It's done. I would have done. Done. You'll have like a yeah. world full of chemists. I had a geology professor that had us lick rocks. Yeah. Like literally to see if they were salty we had or a lot metallic. Of connections. Yeah. I That's thought it was strange at the time, but Piaget, the great uh, psychologist and educator. And a child psychologist yeah. was, uh, he, he said, the, to a child, the world is something to be licked. And, yeah. and what he was communicating about that, it has, sounds gross, <laughs> it's so gross, but it's actually very meaningful and, and kind of wise of children yeah. because what they're doing is they have so many sensory things on their tongue that they're actually getting like as much information into the brain as possible. So they're experiencing their world by putting it in their mouth. Yeah. And that's how they're that's how they're learning their world. That's why children yeah. put everything in their mouth. What was interesting is I, when you were talking about that, I was just remembering like our children when they had high chairs. Yeah. And they're like, you know, they're tasting all the different textures and things. But I also was thinking about remembering that those moments where they were literally just practicing the act of picking something picking up, up. Yeah. and the determination yeah. that little babies have to like really get that thing to their mouth, right? Yeah. And I was thinking about something else you said to me a while ago. 
because I have this perfection complex. When I said we were talking about practice makes perfect. Yeah. And you said, no, 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 no. No. It's practice not. Practice makes effective. Yeah. And, or you progress. Know, and progress. I think that's what you yeah. said. Practice makes progress. progress. Yeah. That's smart. I Which actually was that. very smart. And I will tell you, and I don't say these things, especially not on film, that that, that really was right. And it. I, mean, yeah. I don't say you're right a lot. <laughs> that's true. You got to take it when I can get it. <laughs> You were right because... Um, no, today. <laughs> I was right. No, because I was struggling. I was like beating myself up about something I had been practicing. It might have been in yoga. And you're like, remember, perfection <clears throat> is this crazy mental model unattainable idea that causes us to do things differently. It's kind of a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. And it's not effective. No. And in fact, evolution has a totally different strategy. And it's much smarter. It's called satisficing. A guy named Herbert Simon came up. Satisficing. With it. Yeah, satisficing. It's like evolution and nature mm -hmm. works on a totally different paradigm than perfection. It works on the par paradigm of of um, satisficing rather than optimization. So if you think about it, the whole engineering profession works on optimization, right. making optimal, which is kind of like you know the perfect, the perfect, the best solution. Yeah, right. and and like. Most of life, I'm not saying that there aren't situations yeah. where you need to be optimal, but but most of life is really a satisficing uh, situation where where it's like good enough. When I, when I were, used to work for, <laughs> it's a terrible story, but I used to Don't work trail crews. <laughs> it's not a terrible story, but it, I like the Forest Service, and it's going to make this Forest Service sound bad. But but. Um, uh, we used to work, build trail in yeah. the Pacific Northwest and uh, and in Montana and stuff. And um, there, there was an old saying, which is like, it's good enough for the Forest Service. <laughs> but. Which is like a satisficing model, right? Like you're right. done. You're, it's not done, but it's done enough. But let's try to make that into a positive. So, yeah. for example, what you're doing is sort of cutting trail yeah, right? you're building trail and it doesn't like, have uh, to be manicured and perfect for it to be useful and what you're doing yeah, exactly right? it's kind of a it's a satisfying model it's a it's a it it works Satisfy. oh well you know i once read a story called the good enough mom it was an article written yeah. by anna quinlan yeah and it actually i read it at a great time in my life when i had just had i think our second child mm -hmm. and i was making myself crazy thinking the house had to be completely clean and I had to be completely showered and like everything had to be perfect like yeah. Norman Rockwell and I read this story and and there was one line in it that said some of the happiest kids grow up in the dirtiest house totally and I was like, yes. totally our house was a mess <laughs> like, when I was growing up I'm good yeah. she said don't be the perfect mom be yeah. a good enough mom Totally. Because 100%. then you'll be relaxed enough to be present in the moment and actually enjoy your children 100%. and enjoy your life. I'm dopey. And let yourself off the hook for this perfection thing. Right? Yeah. So satisfying, satisfying isn't saying like, don't, you know, do your best and stuff don't like try. that. It's just saying like most of the time, you know, seeking total perfection is kind of a waste of time. And, and you know, we see this with our yeah. Ivy League students a lot, so we you know, love who we much. love, but but they come programmed with this yeah. perfection paralysis and they're going to release some masterpiece and they're not going to show you anything until they release their masterpiece. And inevitably, that's not really the way masterpieces work. They work on kind of radical incrementalism and, they, you know, like, yeah. show me somebody that's, you know, comes up with an overnight success or an overnight masterpiece right. and I'll show you like... 20 years of hard, iteration. radical incrementalism and, and iteration yeah. of practice that led to that overnight success. So, you know, right. I think it's it, we're always trying to get our students to be like, hey, you know, show us show us what you got so far and then we yeah. can give you feedback and then it can get better. and then it can get better. You can, it can you know, better, incremental better. kind of uh, progress. rather See, than So you practice even writing. Yeah, like absolutely. There's practice everything. in everything. Everything. You start, we were saying that we were started this whole thing where we can practice not just physical stuff, but the cognitive or mental stuff. Yep. So that's very hopeful because that means that we can 
not fall prey to the idea that we're just born with certain capabilities and thinking skills versus we can actually develop them. Just I like agree. I can dribble. But I think it's far more, far more remarkable than that. Really? Yeah. You're saying I wasn't remarkable enough? No, I think it's even more <laughs> remarkable. I think it's, I think it's like. How so? So big. How so? How is it so big? Because it's one thing to say, hey, you know, we can, uh, we can practice climbing. What a what an epiphany that we've had. We can practice climbing rather than just do climbing. We can right. practice basketball rather than just do. We can practice underwater basket weaving. Is that a thing? Yeah, I think so. I think it's an Olympic event. <laughs> <laughs> underwater basket weaving. <laughs> My mother always used to use that. She was from Boston, and she I think that's a Boston thing. She had a nice sense of humor. She would always use like. <laughs> For some reason, she would always use the the underwater basket weaving as the as the sort of example of all things. Of all things, like if you if you want to learn underwater basket weaving, like Derek, you can do anything you want as oh, long as that's nice. And then she would use underwater basket <laughs> weaving, or then they would say like, "What classes are you taking?" Just like underwater basket weaving, <laughs> you know, or something like that. I don't even know what I was saying. Um, oh, why it's so big. Why, oh, yeah, you were just saying why it's so remarkable. Yeah, so, you, so it's remarkable to realize that you can practice something. But here's the thing. When you realize that about thinking, mm -hmm. thinking is the root of all those other things. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So when Arnold Schwarzenegger says, you know, he focused on his bicep as he, and that actually increased yeah. his hypertrophy, that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And he put his mind on it. That's a lot of people think, oh, well, there is the mind body connection. And that's true. There is the mind body connection. Right. But what they don't realize is Arnold Schwarzenegger had to think that thought before he was able to practice that thought. Right. So the thinking was what him thinking differently than other people, him having the thought mm -hmm. that we could do this differently than anybody's ever done it. That thought led to that led to the the new practice right and and people kind of miss that because they go oh there's this mind body connection but they don't realize like this guy was what he was having deep thoughts about his <laughs> practice right in weightlifting in in you know and so when somebody I, you know whoever venus williams michael jordan when they think about their game Right. Right. They're thinking differently. What makes them remarkable is not just that they practice Muscles. their game, but yeah. that they think differently about right. their game. So thought drives all that. Thought drives all decision. It drives all emotion. It drives all problem solving. Yeah. It drives all critical thinking. It drives all all the different types of thinking, 30 something different types of thinking. Yeah. It drives all behavior. It drives all action. So, okay, so it is remarkably it's big. It's kind of big. I, I sit corrected. Well, I wasn't correcting you, but no, I, was I, just simple, I was simply saying it's cool in any field. It'd be cool in any yeah. field. Like, I'm trying to think of a field like, you see this too, you see this too in software. Yeah. So, you know, there was a time where, you know, sales was done on the phone, then it was done, you know, it was done person to person yeah, yeah. in a marketplace, then it was done on the phone, then it was done on a, like, you know, on the phone with an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. And then people sort of said, okay, well, people like Mark Benioff or whatever started Salesforce, they sort of said, okay, well, what if we like looked at the patterns of sales right, and broke it down. down. And if yeah. we could break that down, then we could program it. You know, we could, we could scale a sales software that that represents a sales process, right? And then people could get good at that process, right? Yeah. So there was a mo there was a time when sales was this organic, totally yeah. organic thing, and so then somebody had the thought to look at the underlying patterns and break it down, and that leads to things like Salesforce. And then people said, well, oh yeah, but that could never be done for marketing. Well, and yeah. now we have Marketo, and we have all all these right. other right these platforms for marketing, right? So, so thought is driving all that. Thought is driving the ability to look at different processes and look for patterns and then reduce those patterns and then scale them into companies or, you know, whatever processes or right. practices or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So not to go too deep, yeah. but 
it's kind of exciting. It is exciting, and it and it makes me think when you're talking about all these underlying these patterns of uh, underlying these processes, right? Yeah. And that in order to help other people do them, we have to break them down into their parts and sort of, you know, make them something that's distilled. But then the question is, and this is the deep part, so then what does that mean about if I just want to practice thinking? Yeah. I don't want to practice thinking about sales. I don't want to practice thinking about basketball or my bicep. I yeah. just want to practice thinking. Yeah. Well, that seems like a totally different beast in some ways. Yeah, you got to know what to practice. Right, and I don't think that people have a sense of that because, like we were saying before, when you say to somebody, well, think about it, Yeah. there's not a common understanding of what that means to think yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, we know, for example, from our research, we know that there's a Pareto law of thinking, which is yeah. like an 80-20 rule. You, the like 20% is going to get you the 80%. Mm -hmm. And that Pareto law is five moves. Five moves. Like thinking moves. Thinking moves. Yeah. Things you do. Things you do, like a push-up, but for thinking. A, a push-up that builds your ability, that burns the neural pathways that to think, to think better about anything. And there's five of these moves. I actually have them in tape on the, my gym floor, and I practice I them, you know, like I practice yes. practicing them to yes, see I if the, that's helpful. Yeah. And so there's five little moves that you can do, and they're very easy. You can learn them in a few minutes, and and then you practice them, just like a, you could learn a push-up in a, in a minute. Right, so two. the analogy is if, if I'm trying to practice and learn basketball, I'm going to dribble, I'm going to pass, I'm going to shoot. Yeah. And you're saying the analogy is if I want to really... You're going to dribble right. You're going to dribble left. You're going to well, shoot that's a long. Lot you're going to shoot short. I just you know. try one hand. Yeah, whatever. Right. I'm right. not a basketball player. Right. But I can play a good game of horse. Right. But yeah. the point is, as you, get more, as you get more sophisticated, you're really just doing the basics more. Right. Right. So no matter how good you get, it really is just getting better and better and better at right. the refinement of those basics. And these five moves are like the basics of thinking. Yeah, and I will, you know, it, what's interesting is, I mean, many, many years ago when we first met, I was sort of skeptical about that idea, right? Mm -hmm. That there are these sort of patterns that underlie all thinking. Yeah. I was, you know, Everybody to be is. honest, I was a little skeptical. And then, and mm -hmm. then I started to really... Um, embed those things into my daily life, like practice, um, you know, distinct, you know, differentiating things or making sure I was paying attention to relationships between things or forcing myself to remember to take many perspectives, like Bob, our good friend Bob, right, needing to take perspectives. So I guess if it were me, it, it's good to know or to acknowledge that that seems like a, an interesting and somewhat bold claim. That there's there's like a set of five things you can do, just five things that give you all of these benefits in terms of, you know, getting better at being a, a thinker and thinking about anything. I can see why people would think that's a bold claim, but I, it seems like kind of obvious to me. Uh, I, I think, you know, I'm always surprised when I meet psychologists and stuff like that, people that study the brain or, yeah. you know, cognitive scientists or something like that. And they go, well, how could how could it all come down to universal patterns? And you're like, if there's no patterns in cognition, if there's no patterns in psychology, then there is no need for the field of psychology or cognition. Because if you can't, if you can't find pattern... Mm -hmm. then it's unpatterned, which means it's random, random. which it's means chaos. there's nothing to study. <laughs> what are you going to study? So it's sort of it's sort of like um, they're kind of putting themselves out of a job if they think that there's no pattern. You'd like them. Why are you a psychologist or a cognitive scientist if you don't think there's a pattern? That'd be like, you know, everything in the universe is random but I'm a physicist. I guess that. <laughs> but then what are you studying? You're just studying like the imperceptible infinite randomness of yeah. nothingness. 
Yeah, no, I get that. I, I guess for me, it's... I mean, it like, seems obvious is the point. Yeah, but it's, it's obvious not. obvious that it's patterned. But it's not. It's not obvious to everybody. No, 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 no. It's probably not, but it's... It's it fine is. that it's obvious to you, and that's why you're you, but it's not obvious to everybody. And, and so I think part of our sort of life's mission or vision is to make it obvious to everybody so that they have an... No, 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 I don't mean that it's... I don't mean that the patterns are obvious. What I mean, mean that I mean that that there are patterns and we should look for them is obvious. No. Really? That's not. Oh, really? <laughs> no. That's what I'm telling you. Because people believe that thinking just happens and that you're either good at it or you're not. And nobody tells them it nobody told me in school, hey, you can get better at that. Yeah. That's because you listened in school. Yeah, but a lot of people listen in school. I, didn't listen I in know, school. but you're not everybody. You know, it's funny. Uh, there's a story about Einstein, and and there's a reporter. Yeah. And the reporter asked Einstein, and they're like, "Hey, you know, like, why do you think you of all people, you know, like you didn't do that well in school, and didn't yeah, yeah. really do that well, and you're a patent clerk, and why would you of all people be the guy that discovers?" you know, uh, the theory of relativity, like one of the most important theories, you know, and, yeah. and Einstein said, oh, that's actually quite simple. Uh, in fifth or sixth grade, I don't remember the exact quote, but something to the effect of in fifth or sixth grade, when, when the teacher had covered time and space and like all the students understood it and then they moved on to the next more difficult topic, mm -hmm. I because of my limited faculty <laughs> got stuck on time and space and thought about it well into my 30s so he was I just stuck gave yeah, i never gave up <laughs> so it's just like you know we see genius but he sees oh i just, just i was stuck. stuck and i didn't i stopped listening to everything after that and i focused on like just this weird inconsistency you know between found. time and space that he mm -hmm. couldn't quite grasp you know right so sometimes when we listen to the societal um right norms right you know we get we we believe silly things but we believe silly things because we believe silly things and we need to be disabused of those I agree. indoctrinated kind of beliefs that hold us back from 100%. seeing our full potential, reaching our full potential. Yeah. And we need to address that. I mean, that's important. Yeah, I agree. You know, so I was an A student. Yeah. I was a good student. I was really good at school. I loved going to school. I thought school was awesome, et cetera, et cetera. But as when I, you know, graduated from an Ivy League university with my PhD, I was in many ways not flexible or, you know, a very good sort of, uh, I was very good at like linear and linguistic kind of thinking and, and sort of indoctrinated into that. But it wasn't until I sort of started to, you know, work with you and, and understand all of the things about your theories and visualizing and all of these that I sort of, I believe, yeah. my brain became kind of more plastic, right? And I got better at thinking about anything, not just school-related stuff, but like anything that I was dealing with. And that's why I think it's important, you know, well, what does that look like? How do you get better at it? You said there's five things. Yeah, not to take a total tangent here, but but I, but, but that's your specialty. <laughs> total tangents. But like <laughs> the what really happened there isn't that your brain became more plastic. Your brain was was, was always plastic. always plastic, and you got indoctrinated into thinking in linear and linguistic ways right. because you got little Scooby snacks for doing that. Yes, right. So like a seal, you're like <laughs> that's not like that's what seal. school's like, right? And <laughs> And you'd like, and you get a Scooby snack, and then you're like, hey, what did I get a Scooby snack for? And and you're like, oh, I got a Scooby snack for being very linear in and my thinking and something. memorizing things and then it. regurgitating it. And I got a Scooby snack for, you know, writing what the teacher told me to write, you know? And 
I mean, I remember one time I, 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 we wrote a, we read a book, which I thought the book was good. It was called the out, the, um, the outsiders or something. Oh, yeah. That's a good book. That was a good book. Yeah. And it had a Tommy Boy in it or something. And they like made that. a book, a movie. Yeah, it was a good book. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember resonating with that book. But I thought I loved the book, but I just couldn't like make myself write the report. Like About I because I had ADD, I didn't know I had ADD and all that kind of stuff. And anyway, my father and I were building like this. I was the thing I was most interested in. My father and I were building this diorama of like the beautiful dioramas in the Natural History Museum of, of Na Native American villages. You were building one about Native American villages. Yeah, like at beautiful, the time. Yeah. a beautiful diorama. It yeah. was like high end for a little you. kid. And uh, so I turned in the diorama instead of the report. <laughs> and the teacher was like... You turned in a physical diorama about Native American village yeah. to satisfy a book report yeah. On the outsiders. Yeah. Okay. Because I thought How'd it was go? cool. And I was engaged in it. And I was learning. Yeah. And I thought school was about learning. Yeah. Not I I it took me many years to realize that school is not about learning. That was like honestly one of the hardest things for me to learn was that school was not about learning. Because I would go to my family's dinner table and it was like all about learning. And then I would go to school where I where everybody was like, Oh, the school is a place you learn. And I would be like, this is nothing like my family dinner table where I learned tons of stuff. This is like you're just getting in yeah. trouble and, you you know, you, you, you're you supposed to toe the line. And it didn't have anything to do with learning or creativity. Well. So I turned in this thing and, like, my teacher was not happy. No. No, of course not. Because, well, why not? Because the teacher was hamstrung by what was the expectation. I would have been like, thing. cool diorama, kid. Yeah, but. But Did you really build this? Because it's pretty teachers awesome. Teachers are locked There's into like standards and like, rubrics. They have yeah. no choice. It was right? amazing. This thing was amazing. Well, and also, I would, I would, I'm going to push back a little bit on what you just said. Okay, push. So school isn't about learning, is what you said, and I would correct that to say school was about a particular type of learning and a particular um, set of skills and standards that they're trying to meet, and it wasn't. To prepare you for it wasn't to prepare to you for, for the man, right? But it wasn't it 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 what they are not able to address all the different types of learners, right? That's why they have all these differentiated curriculums now. And don't look at me with that skeptical <laughs> little stink kind of thing. <laughs> I'm just funny. saying, like, I mean, I learned a lot in school, but everything I learned was in a very particular type of. Uh, instruction and education yeah, yeah, yeah. but i i maybe i'm taking personal offense but i learned a lot it just well, there's I didn't no learn doubt that if you put someone anywhere for 15 years they're gonna learn a lot yeah because they're humans they're human animals and they're yeah. learners by nature so you're gonna learn a lot yeah the question is how much could they have learned in a more effective school system the question isn't, did you learn a lot in 15, 18, 25 right. years of education? Right. The question is, what could you have learned if we had an effective system that actually tied into the amazing properties of humans as learners? Right. Like we're designed to learn. Right. And then dealt really with good at it. Right. And dealt with many different modes yeah. of learning yeah. that dealt with neurodiversity, that dealt with... Or just didn't deal with like information memorization and regurgitation, right, 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 right? right? And control, frankly, social control. Well, that's a big word, but it's true. It's true. It's true. It's but... true in our age, and it's true for our children. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it serves a vital function in that sense. I'm not against indo indoctrinating people into the society because you have to, you, you, have you know to, they, yeah. you have to you have to get I'm, but but you know. I don't think that has to go to the to the point of teaching them to think linearly, which yes. is totally in Limited. the antithesis of the way the actual world works, right. because the actual world w works in webs of causality, not linear causalities. Right. You know, to think in very bivalent or binary black or white terms, because that's not the way the real world works. The no. real world is multivalent or gray. Yeah. So if we're training kids to think in these ways... And the real world is not those ways, 
then that is a, a problem. misuse of education. Well, and it That's sets people serving. up to struggle. Yeah, it sets them up to struggle. And we don't want them to have to struggle. We want to set them up to succeed in whatever they want to succeed in, not in whatever normative definition of success that people aspire to. Yeah, I mean, it's not to avoid struggle because challenge is change, right? So we want struggle. Yeah. We just don't want unnecessary, like, bullshit struggle. We want struggle in the meaningful areas, struggle. meaningful struggle, right? Purposeful like, not, struggle. Like, I'm going to yeah. hold my finger on you and stop you from moving. Yeah. You know, that's just Challenge brilliant. is change. And guess yeah. what else? Practice is progress. Bingo. That's a good one. Challenge is change. Practices, practices progress. progress. Yeah. Yep. I think that's true. Like radical incrementalism is the way of the, the universe. Radical incrementalism. Yeah. Does it have to be radical? I think it should be radical. What makes it radical? That you're super into it. <laughs> that's what makes it radical. Yeah, totally. It's not like, it's not like, uh, like, it's not like uh, Che Guevara or something like that radical. It's just radical like it's, Everywhere. It's fractally embedded in the universe. Okay. You mean across many levels of scale, across. there's this incrementalism built in yes. to everything we to do. To everything. And it, and it gets rid of this whole idea of perfection and all of this. It's like, we yeah. just need to be making progress. Yes. And if we're making progress, yeah. then we're in good shape. Yeah. Then you're better every day and then you're good. You're That's good. how evolution works. That's how like training works that's how all all skill works it's super important well so i i really have appreciated the shift in my mindset from you know practice makes perfect which i was pretty much raised on i love you mom it's okay and <laughs> to moving towards and i think as you get older you have to be kind of more forgiving you know of yourself and so this whole idea that practice makes progress has sort of uh, been both motivational in the sense that I'm like, I'm making progress and also... Why do you have to be more forgiving as you get older? Well, if you're indoctrinated into the idea that you have to be perfect at everything, then you cause oh. yourself unnecessary stress when you're actually doing really well. You're never doing well enough if you have this uh. aspiration to something that you can't reach, which is perfection. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Perfection is like a unicorn, right? It's just like... It's not real. Yeah, I call that Norman Rockwelling. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's we, like, like I think it's, it's why a lot of people don't enjoy their wedding day, right? Yes. It, it, because they they create this norm, Norman Rockwell was a painter who... who yeah, you know, did, painted the ideal American... Sense. Yeah, ideal American... Family life. Right, and so <laughs> it was like this idyllic Perfect. painting. Yeah, and... Um, and... Uh, if you set up whatever it is with these expectations, mm -hmm. it's kind of living in the future and you paint this picture of how things yeah. are going to be or yeah. how things should be, right? Whether it's your wedding or whether it's like, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is, but you're constantly living in the future of perfection or idealism. Right. And then you're comparing reality to this fake picture. This ideal that and so, and sense. you're literally like, hmm, which one do I, which one is better? Mm -hmm. The fake picture, the picture that doesn't exist mm -hmm. and therefore shouldn't even be considered or reality, reality. Like, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Right. Right. And reality is. And know, then you're disappointed about reality. Yes. Instead reality. of being like, reality is pretty cool. We had a great wedding We want to love reality. Just to say, we had a great wedding day and we had a hurricane. We did. I wasn't talking about our wedding. I know, but I'm just I'm, saying. I'm saying we didn't do wondering. that. Yeah, we had, we had a hurricane, hurricane and had an amazing day. wedding. Yeah, it was amazing. Everybody was in wellies. It was good. Yeah. But uh, that's what I'm saying. Had had you had a, an idyllic picture of exactly what it was supposed to be, yeah. you would be bummed out that it wasn't that because, you know, the tent came down and the hurricane came and the trees were falling and it was total To be fair, the tent chaos. didn't come down. The oh, tent, blue. The 160-foot tent yeah. inverted and flew half a mile down the woods. Into the forest. Yeah. That's not blew away. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, we, we still enjoyed the day. Yes, we did. Because we didn't so have was the this, day. this uh, perfection picture. Right, which is So weird. you want to not do that in life. No, you want to understand. You want to love reality. Love reality and that practice makes progress. And that's radical incrementalism yeah. in the moment. So there's a story about radical incrementalism. You always have a good story. 
and it ties in like you know thinking mm -hmm. and all the things we've been talking about education thinking wow. the way people think the way they're trained that they okay tell that us kind of it stuff. sounds good tell us so when people discovered kind of the grand canyon and learned about the grand canyon they yeah. the initial thinking was how, you know how could something what could have caused this huge canyon mm -hmm. that is so magnificent and the thinking is well, something so large would have needed a very large cause. So they thought it was like a tidal wave or wow. like some kind of huge yeah. wave caused the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And when scientists came along and said, actually, no, kind of like radical incrementalism of many, many years over much time, you know, trickle of water on rock, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. yeah you yeah. know, um, the you know, river created it. Really? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And they were like, nah, that's not possible. It's got to be, you know, big cause. Yeah, yeah. Big, big effect. effect. So yeah. if you have a big effect, you got to look for a big cause. Right, right. And they didn't see, you know, big effect, tiny cause over multiple, over, over time. Right? Interesting. And so that's not the way we think. We think big, big effect, big cause. Big right. cause, big effect. But sometimes right? lots of little things over time. Many, many, many little incremental mm -hmm. things uh lead to big things micro uh, we say the micro makes the macro yes the micro makes the macro That's one of my so favorites. radical incrementalism is about the micro making the macro meaning things don't happen suddenly no. like there wasn't suddenly the grand canyon was there because of a title yeah movie. you're saying that's actually a great point because there's a great thing in the uh in the uh, i think um i think kabbalists uh, uh, talk about this uh mm, yeah the um they call it suddenly syndrome oh yeah yeah and suddenly syndrome is like that these things happen suddenly you know like suddenly i you know i got a divorce suddenly yeah. i was overweight suddenly i you know yeah. lost my job suddenly yeah. and nothing happens suddenly no you know there's always many preceding factors that lead to that sudden event Right. The Same with the genius, right? right. And they're like, oh, suddenly yeah. an overnight success. Well, yeah. not really. But people don't see that. People don't see it. They don't see, see that back end of all the stuff that would And they don't it. see it because they don't, they're, we're not trained to see it. Right. By schools. We don't train people to see, we don't train people the way nature works. No. And you can practice thinking, which drives everything. Yeah. Which is exciting. Which means you can get better. At everything. Every day. Not just get better at thinking. You get better at every, thinking. And everything. And you can get thinking. better at everything every day. That's the part that blows my mind. Now, see, that's remarkably big. That's what I was saying. But now I see it better. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. So now that we've gotten me to that point, let's yeah. let's call this. Let's make this. This is a wrap. That's a wrap. That was fun. That's it. That's it. We're out. Mm -hmm.